If you enjoy this program, please like and subscribe. They all want to convert Jews. And in fact, today we are living in a time almost the only people who are involved in Jewish evangelism are Christian Zionists. Color your lab on the air. Please tell us your name where you're sir. Home. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. How's it going? Uh, Doing good. Thank you. My name is Liam, and I'm actually from Georgia. I was going to ask, what does Rabbi think about Christian Zionism and how it relates to, uh, I guess, the letters and the, um, I guess, to writings of Paul, and how it seems that those that are in true Israel are the Jews that accept Jesus, and it seems that you know today we have this, you know, movement, which is, you know, I guess you could say, you know, dispensationalistic, and it seems to to ignore that for 1,800 years, the Church did not see, I guess, Jews in the way that modern and Christian Zionists see, and where is the discrepancy? So, you're quite accurate. Uh, until the 19th century, almost all Christians believed in replacement theology. I could just say all. The Orthodox Church, the Roman Catholic Church, the Protestant Church, the Reformers all thought that the Jews were once chosen, but because of their crime, not just of non-belief, but killing Jesus, they're no longer chosen and the church has replaced them. And they would have plenty, plenty of passages in the Christian Bible from which to pick from. Christian Zionism emerges in the 19th century. A man born in England, John Nelson Darby in the year 1800, comes to America. If he had not done that, he would have, no one would have ever heard of him, but the United States was Uh, fertile ground to hear his dispensationalist message. Now, dispensationalism means many things. It means, for example, that there are many different epochs in God's or economies, spiritual economies in different epochs of history, and we're not going to talk about that. We're not going to talk about how many dispensations he thought or his followers thought they were, because that's not germane to your question. What is germane is Darby believed that the Jews were God's chosen people. You can see why this would not sit well with the Church of England. I mean, this is not complicated, but it would sit well with Americans, founding fathers. This would sit very well with Americans, would not sit well with European Christians. And that God, in fact, has a covenant with the Jews that can never be eradicated, ever. And he was, it's true he was appealing to Romans, but he was really appealing to plain verses in the Hebrew Bible. And that's why dispensationalists are quoting the Hebrew Bible a lot, a lot. Dispensationalists, premillennial dispensation, we're going to Ignore the word premillennial because that's their eschatology, but it's not germane to your question. And we're not going to deal with dispensationalism because they're called that, but that also is not germane. That's about just God had a different um, salvific economy with diff- in different periods of time. We're actually not going to talk about that because it's not germane to your question. We're going to talk about this. this is very be very precise here. He believed that God had two covenants, two covenants, one with the Jews, the physical Jews, and that's why they're still here. And that promise that God made to the Jews is eternal, it's unbreakable, and the Lord who created the sun to illuminate the day, the stars and the moon, the night, if these laws should pass before me, so will the children. Israel is forever, and they have to be blessed, and the land of Israel belongs to the people of Israel. This was radical, but the United States was very um, was fertile ground for this because America was born out of a crucible of rejecting the Church of England, of rejecting the royal brute, 
of Great Britain, King George III. So they saw in the Jew a, a kinship. I mean, George Washington had a favorable view of Jews. Alexander Hamilton spoke Hebrew. His mother converted to Judaism. He went to Hebrew school in the Caribbean. He was very, um, he had a very, very favorable view of Jewish people. It was very, so therefore, th these ideas would ferment. And of course, he needed, um, John Nelson Darby needed followers who knew how to speak and convey. And he found them in a lawmaker from Kansas, uh, Cyrus Schofield, who would publish a Bible with commentary that was dispensationalist that would be published in the early 20th century. In the early 20th century, the Schofield Bible was published, I think, I think by World War I, it had sold four million copies, which is astounding at the time. It it was my and really they're not appealing to Romans. They're really appealing to the Hebrew Bible, the blessing Israel, blessing the Jews, God has preserved them. And Isaiah chapter 60, Amos chapter 9. So what they believe is that God has two covenants. One is with the a spiritual covenant with Christians. That's an eternal that's a spiritual heavenly covenant. So those who are part of the church are saved. Jews are not saved if they don't believe in Jesus. This is very critical. They just believe that the covenant that God has with the Jews is on this earth, and the Jews are chosen. That's why they couldn't be destroyed. And Israel belongs to the Jewish people, every square inch of it. And the Jews must have it, and the Jews must be there, all of it, not give up one inch. And then there's a war— and based on uh, many misunderstandings of the text, they think that most of the Jews are going to get killed, a massive misunderstanding of Zechariah 13, but that's – we're going off thing. So, so the, God is a physical covenant with – and this – James Belfour believed in this, the foreign secretary, the founder of the Red Cross. This is – this – this idea that the Jews were chosen and that covenant was never broken is all over Tanakh. And that's why dispensationalists quote Tanakh a lot. I mean, they quote the Hebrew Bible a lot. They take it, they take it very seriously. Christian Zionists take it very seriously, very seriously. And in Tanakh, you don't need to, this is not complicated. I mean, Isaiah 60. Arise and shine for your light has come. Kings will go by your light. The sons of them that afflicted you will come and bow to you. It does not mean that we're going to make the world into slaves. It means they're going to join the Jewish people. That's all it means. And they're going to repair your walls. It's all over. It really is all over the place. Because that's the nature of the messianic age is that the guy going to say, we want to join you. We want to be a servant to you. Now, a servant in Tanakh doesn't mean a black man in Alabama in 1820. No, that's sin. The slave, the Eved in Tanakh is someone who joins your family. We want to be a part of this. I want to hold on to your shirt. When Avram Avinu was informed by HaKadosh Baruch Hu that out of him would come a great nation, his first thought was a slave because Eliezer was his Eved from Damascus. Hashem says, no, it's not. It's, it has to be someone from your loins, an actual biological. Read the first five verses of Genesis 15. So it is very refreshing to hear um, anyone and Christians quoting a lot of Tanakh. For th it's a no-brainer. I mean, if you read Tanakh, just straightforward, the, you have to do such... Um, Somersaults, it requires a circus act to insert replacement theology in Tanakh. It's, I know what they do. It's, a, it's a, an ugly game. Now, in, in the church, this was standard fare. In the Roman Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church still believes that. Now, one caveat should be made. This is big. I don't think I've ever said this. 
very frequently when an idea takes off in the Christian world among one sect, the idea can become popular all over the place, okay? So you have um, the Pentecostal movement begins in the early 20th century, right? Catches on like wildfire. So the Pentecostal or charismatic movement uh, begins within a certain area, a certain domain of Protestant Christianity, but wow, it infiltrates everywhere, and the Roman Catholic, there are Roman Catholics that are speaking in tongues, okay? All right. So while Christian Zionism begins with Darby and Moody and Scofield, I mean, these are the big names in Moody Bible Institute, um, that's Moody. I mean, these there are many other names. These are big, big names that are promoting this as spreading all. It will go on to Europe too. But it, the notion of Christian Zionism will make sense to a lot of people. And while they don't adopt other features of premillennial dispensationalism, both the premillennial element, which just means how exactly the end, the eschatology unfolds or where it happens, not germane, but they don't accept that, you know. And they may not accept the dispensationalism element that there are different epochs where there's a different spiritual economy. They don't, but they they understand the Christian Zionism because they're going to Tanakh. It's not that they're all going to Tanakh, but that's the bread and butter of it because Tanakh is just a no-brainer. The Jewish people return, Jeremiah 30, verse 3. It's just so clear, clear. Now, what happens in every cult, in every Cult's a good word, is they take every cult, every false teaching, listen, I'll teach you, this is very big. If you listen to this, you're going high. Every cult dispenses with clear passages in favor of ambiguous passages. If you remember that, you are way up there. Every false doctrine, every f cult, Okay, what they're always doing is you have clear passages in a sacred text, Tanakh, very clear passages. If the Jews are returning, the land, clear, 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 you're going to return. I tell you, Jeremiah 30, verse 3. Zechariah, chapter 12, verse 9. In those days, Hashem is going to destroy all the those who all the nations that come up against Jerusalem. Like, what are you thinking? Every listen up, sweethearts. If you get what I'm saying now, you're going to a different level in your ability to discern. An Orthodox group, low case O. Orthodox means that we have before us clear passages that are unambiguous, and we have, of course, these vague verses that are not exactly clear. We get what is generally happening, but it's not spelt out clear. Orthodoxy always will favor the clear passages and interpret the passages that are ambiguous in light of the clear text, always. You're always going to have in Tanakh, as an example, a clear passages, which is the vast majority of it, and then you have some ambiguous verse that can be taken out of context, misunderstood, written poetically. Isaiah is just flaming mad, but you don't get the— I mean, Isaiah says, where is your bill of divorcement? Where is the—who are these creditors to whom you were sold? Isaiah 50, verse 1. Isaiah, what is he screaming like that for? <laughs> Isaiah, Christians only know Isaiah 3. Because people think maybe Hashem is done with the Jews. So he asks, where is, your, where is this Sefer Croesus? Where is this divorcement that I to where who are these creditors to whom you were sold? It means a person can't pay a debt, so you have to give away what you have. You have, you can't pay. It comes time to pay. You don't have it. You have to give away your car. When did I give you away? 
Oh, I was screaming at you for, yeah, I've screamed at you because you're my kid. I love you. <laughs> Kindalach, it's time to do tshuva. It's so it's time. So the Christian Zionism was correct, meaning Darby got it. So again, forget premillennial, forget cessationism. They Now, now, caveat. They don't believe that Jews are saved because they're Jewish spiritually. They had to be converted to Christianity. And all these Christian Zionists who reject replacement theology, which is the standard or covenant theology or new Israel theology, there's a million names for it. It's replacement theology. They all want to convert Jews. And in fact, today we are living in a time where the Almost the only people who are involved in Jewish evangelism are Christian Zionists. They all are. And understand, they really are Zion. They really are pro-Israel. I mean, really pro-Israel. They really are. But they are not slow to exploit their support for Israel as a way of evangelizing Jews. The Catholic Church, though the Catholics never try to convert Jews— it's rare. It happens. There are some oddballs out there. There are, but it's these are generally outliers. What is the Catholic? So in the Orthodox Church, of course, they all would like to convert Jews, but they're they're not involved with this kind of stuff. It's not their game. And part of it is that they don't think the Jews are chosen anymore. So while it would give them a rush, you know, when Robert Novak from CNN, you know, you know he. He got his big reward now. Oh, he hated Israel. He became a Catholic. He became a Catholic. What was he called? The Prince of Darkness? I forgot what they called him. He was a, a vicious person, Person really. He was born Jewish, but he became a Catholic. And wow, did he turn against Israel? Forget about it. Vicious, vicious guy. Just a, a vicious person. He, a lot of these guys, when they should know, when they become Catholic, I could think of, I can also think of some evangelicals. Some of them are Hank Hanegraaff, right? The Bible Answer Man. So he was a Protestant and he joined the Greek Orthodox Church. But right away, I don't know what the heck he's doing these days, but right away, his anti Israel stuff was flying. You could sniff it like what's happening there, you understand? Because it, it, today the evangelical world generally is very pro-Israel, very Zionist. And if people really are, do not like the Jews in the land of Israel and don't think the Jews belong, see, this is a big problem. You think it's just hatred of Jews. All the church fathers, all of them with one voice said – that the Jews were expelled from the land of Israel and the temple was destroyed because they killed Jesus and their God's done with them. Done. They'll never return. They're finished. All the church fathers, all of them, said that the Jews would never return and Augustine in his magnum opus said that the reason why the Jews are still around is an example of a people, what would happen to a people who rejected Christ, if they would live in misery among us. That this is All the church fathers taught this. The Jews would never return back. Never, never, never. That's why they, when, when Herzl went to Pius in the early 20th century asking that he might support a Jewish state— he told them, "We're not. We're not going to accept. You don't recognize our Lord. I'm not. We're not recognizing your state." And he added, "Our priests will be waiting for you in Jerusalem to baptize all of you." I'm not kidding. Those were his words. So, therefore, when the state of Israel emerged in 1948, to the Catholic Church, there was no way. The Catholic Church will be very happy to have a diplomatic relations with, with the Nazi Germany. That's not a problem. But the Jewish state, they wouldn't recognize it. They wouldn't recognize it because it, it undermined everything the church fathers, all of them, taught against this. It was the Orthodox Church, even crazier than the, than the, um, than the Catholic Church. I mean, they didn't have Pope John XXIII who was very much the, the anti-Pope against, meaning he was the opposite of Pius XII. He was, relatively speaking, a nice fellow. 
He's the one who convened the Second Vatican Council. So the Catholic Church, this is no way, no way. And they didn't even know what the Catholics didn't know what to do when there was a state of Israel. They certainly wouldn't have diplomatic relations with Israel. So they didn't recognize it. But then their thinking was, well, the Jews don't have Jerusalem. They don't have Jerusalem. They don't really have Israel because Jerusalem is everything. 67, they went nuts. They went nuts. Now, where am I going with all this is something that is intriguing in the Christian world because it's Christianity is the most highly variegated religion in the world by far. So what happens is you have ideas that emerge in one iteration of Christianity – Reformed theology, but it then bleeds in. There are like Reformed Baptists, who, or there are people who subscribe to many of the ideas in Reformed theology, Calvinism, but are not Calvinists and have different views of the Eucharist and so on. The Pentecostal movement moved all over the place, as did Christian Zionism. So whereas Christian Zionism emerges out of Darby, emerges out of uh, premillennial dispensationalism, it then spreads all over the world. For example, I'll just give you one example. So there are Anglicans who are called, there's even a group called Anglicans for Israel. They're very pro-Israel. This is a very interesting um, example. So there are Anglican Zionists who are very, very pro-Israel. But they don't believe, as this is very intriguing, they're watching this and say, okay, we're looking at the Hebrew Bible. It's all clear the Jews are the return to Israel. But they don't believe in the eschatology of Darby, and they don't believe in his dispensations, his spiritual economies of history. So they don't accept that. Not only that, the Anglican Zionists, who are the conservative Anglicans— they don't even believe in two covenants. And this will blow your head away. Now, when I say they, I'm talking generally speaking, okay? You know, there's exceptions. All. There are even juggles of who are fiercely anti-Israel and driving them nuts. Forget, forget them, you know. I'm not talking about the outliers. So the Anglicans, Christian Zionists, they hold this one covenant, and that's only with the Jews. Where's there a covenant with, with the church? So this is so intriguing. So the Christian Zionism that emerges in one place and takes root in one iteration seeps into other Christian armaments. Today there are many Roman Catholics, I know them, who are fierce Christian Zionists. And not only they support Israel because they for a variety of reasons, but they believe that this is a this is a sign of the restoration of the Jews who fell in Tanakh. So there is the picture of what has occurred, what's in plain view in Tanakh. And the the problem for the Catholic Church is that the and the Orthodox Church, all the Church Father of Chrysostom, they were vicious anti-Semites, every one of them. The Jews were done with. The Harabayat being destroyed was a symbol of how loathsome the Jew was in the eyes of God for rejecting Christ and worse um Killing him. And that's why the church wasn't interested in building anything on the Temple Mount. Let let the Temple Mount lie there in a state of ruin as a monument to God's displeasure with the Jew. See? That's what happened. And so that so you need to know that that all these isms within Christianity, they begin in one area in one sect, but the ideas then move into other sects and they will pick the elements of it that easily conform to the iteration of Christianity they once believed. And we're living in a marvelous time, a remarkable time. If people can't see with their own eyes now, they're blind. If people don't hear it, they they may have ears, they may have eyes, but they're they're deaf and blind. It's all unfolding now in a marvelous way. And it is these Christian Zionists that are turning to the God of Israel, becoming B'nai Noach, and converting to the Jewish faith. Keep us in your prayers. Thank you so much. If you enjoyed this program, please like and subscribe. <laughs> Nivra, 
בכאב צוקות, אזי מלך, אזי מלך שמו נקרא, ואחרי כבלות הכל לבדו, ימלוך נורא. 